There they lie, just off the city centre. Shaped by nature, landscaped by men. This is Bukit Brown Cemetery. At rest are the country's forefathers, whose collective timeline span 150 years of our development into modern Singapore. Their tombstones are touchstones in living memory for a new generation of descendants. This is our history from the hills. The Civilian War Memorial, situated in the city centre, is dedicated to the civilians who perished during the Japanese occupation here in Singapore. The end of the war in September 1945 was the beginning of closure for families who lost loved ones. Peter Park, the writer of a heritage blog, Rojak Librarian, is on the trail of a war hero whose roots can be traced to Bukit Brown, but whose final resting place is across from the cemetery at McRitchie Reservoir. So when I was researching on Lim Daw, I said, hey, oh, his son is Mr. Lim Bo Singh. So I thought of making a trip down to Marichi Reservoir to also pay respects uh, to Lim Bo Singh's uh, tomb. Lim Bo Singh was the first son of Lim Lo, a building contractor in late 19th century Singapore, who was buried in Bukit Brown. His gravestone still marks the spot, although his remains were exhumed many years ago. Limbo Singh himself remains one of Singapore's more famous war heroes. He was one of the leading members of Force 136, a special underground force formed by the British to support resistance groups behind enemy lines. His unit operated in Malaya. Limbo Singh was arrested by the Japanese in uh, March 1944, and uh, he was tortured and they, they tried to make him tell where were the rest of the Force 136 members were. And he never said a word. He was tortured, put into uh, a prison which were uh, in terrible condition, conditions. And he died as a result of uh, probably dysentery uh, in, in, in prison. So, and he was buried I, in this prison in Batu Gaja, Para, uh, and uh, in a probably in a, in, a, in a marked grave just beside the prison, I suppose. His remains were, were brought back to Singapore and given a hero's funeral. There are pictures of, of his funeral in, in City Hall near the Padang and finally uh, interred uh, right behind me uh, where you see in Marichi Reservoir. It wasn't as grand as what you see right now. It was just a simple marker and later on the, the Lim Bo Singh Memorial Fund erected uh, a, a, a much more uh, better tomb bef befitting of his, of, his, of his contributions and efforts. While Lim Bo Singh's contribution to the nation was in the theatre of war, Lim Lo's contribution was in the commercial landscape of Singapore. Lim Lo is a Tauke and an industrialist. He was a building contractor and in, and uh, he was responsible for uh, a number of iconic buildings in Singapore that still exist today. For example, the Guru Park Hotel. Uh, he built the Parliament House and also the Victoria Theatre, I believe. What interests me is the in interconnectivity of between one person and another through time. And I guess uh, by sharing that, also let people people aware, without Mr. Lim Law, there won't be Mr. Lim Bo Singh. So it's, 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 it's just that kind of, uh, I guess, connection that I'm trying to make and share with uh, people who are, who are reading, reading the article. Notably, Lim Lo left his mark in the Hong Sang Si Temple, started by Laman migrants in 1827. Born in Laman County, Fujian Province, he never forgot his birthplace. He designed and led the rebuilding of the temple in 1908 when it was relocated to Mohammed Sultan Road. The temple, which was built in the traditional Southern Chinese style, once housed one of Singapore's earliest free schools. In 1914, we so he 
Among the founding members of Nanming School was Lim Ki Tong. Alex Lim, his great great grandson, shares early memories of visiting the tomb as a child. We just pay respect, and, and, and as, as kids, you know, it's fun to play around in the, in, <laughs> in, the, uh, in the rural. But uh, we didn't really know what actually he did. They only said, that, ah, that's your chow all right? So it's only later on, then we, we start to uh, get to uh, understand further what actually he did. He actually contributed much further to, uh, not just to Hong Sanxi, but also in setting up of a primary school for the poor living in the in, uh, River Valley area at that time. It's a different kind of primary school that we know of now, all right? They are basically taught in Hokkien. After they graduate from primary schools, then they say, what's next for them? Because they, again, these kids start to roam again on the street. So, uh, initiated by uh, Mr. Tan Ka Ki, all right? So they get a few school directors, primary school directors, to uh, set up a Chinese secondary school, which is what we have the uh, present Chinese high school. All right. And um, the first committee was actually set up by, I think, 26 such primary schools from uh, various parts of Singapore. And uh, Lim Ki Tong is one of the first committee then. So you can see in the olden days, the primary school in Singapore are differentiated by five different dialects. You've got Hokkien Primary School, Cantonese Primary School, they speak Cantonese in the school. Then after that, Tan Ka Ki in 1919, 1919, start a high school. It's called the Chinese High. The Chinese High School served as a headquarters for the Japanese during the war. After the war, the school resumed providing secondary education in Chinese. By the 1950s, competing education approaches from different groups arose. Half year in the 1950s, this uh, increasingly acrimonious debate about Singapore's political identity. So, should the education system be increasingly Western or Chinese orientated? So, you do have those who look to China, like Tan Lak Sai, who were prepared to put down money for. Nanyang University as the first and only Chinese language university. Others were prepared to support Chinese schools in Singapore. The promotion of Chinese education had a strong advocate in Tan Lak Sai. Tan Lak Sai, a rubber magnet, was a protege of Chinese high school founder Tan Ka Ki. Tan Lak Sai was first buried in Kopi Swa in the Greater Bukit Brown complex of cemeteries. But some years ago, his grave was cleared to make way for a highway. What we know today as Peranakan tiles were actually Art Nouveau Majolica tiles, imported by the British and made popular with the privileged class almost 100 years ago. The Peranakans loved them very much in their homes, as they did to their graves too. Prominent education pioneer Tan Lak Sai's tomb no longer exists at Kupi Swan. But Raymond Goh, a volunteer guide and tomb enthusiast, has discovered where it once stood. We are now actually on uh, Kopi Swan, but Kopi Swan is actually split into two parts by the PIE running across it. At that time, it belonged to the Hokkien Hui Guan. Tan Lak Sai, in fact, was in 1949, uh, and he was actually the president of the Hokkien Hui Guan. So when he died in 1972, he was buried here, in, uh, in this area. But uh, what happened is, uh, a few years later, the, there was a road widening project for this Whitley Road, and he, was, he and his elder brother was uh, one, of the few to, one of the tombs affected by the road widening project. And so they have to exhume him and uh, reinter him in another place. Raymond's research on Tan Lak Sai provides him information beyond the tomb. I know that he was born in uh, 1897 and then he came to Singapore to work in 1914. At that time, he worked under Tan Ka Ki, who was one of the rubber pioneers in Singapore. He himself later went on to set up an Eho company, which became one of the largest rubber export companies uh, in that area at that time. And so, uh, with, when, when he became rich, uh, Tan Lak Sai become, uh, he's also uh, become a philanthropist. No? 
he donated a lot of money to build school. Of course, he's, he's most remembered for actually for setting up this uh, Nanyang University. Tan Lak Sai moved to the idea of Nanyang University in 1953 and went on to contribute $5 million to its initial building fund. He also rounded up his brethren from the Hokkien Hui Kwan to donate 523 acres of land towards the building. Fundraising efforts ran the gamut of the populace, from tycoons to blue-collared workers. One interesting thing I heard is uh, actually from one friend whose father was a, a rickshaw rider. She said that in the past, uh, this, his father know the, the reason why his father remembered uh, Tan Lak Sai so much was because Tan Lak Sai uh, donated a lot to the charity. And at that time, he promised people that for every dollar that you donate, I will match the dollar. You know, he's a businessman, but the way that he's willing to match the donation he shows the greatness of this man. The Hokkien Kui Kwan's contributions to the early education system in Singapore were also mirrored by the Niang Gong Si, which till this day has affiliations with several schools bearing the Niang name. In 1830, prominent Deju leader Xia Yu Chin set up the Niang Gong Si to take care of the welfare of Deju migrants. Expanding into education, Nian Girls School was founded in 1940. Among the Nian Kongsi board members who played a major part in the school was Lim Kim Seng, a successful Teju merchant in 1930 Singapore. I am uh, Mr. Lim Kim Seng's uh, grandson, and probably the last grandson that he saw before he passed away, because I was only about two months when he passed away. He had two wives, and uh, my mother was the uh, first daughter of his second wife. Granddad was actually very actively involved with uh, social activities amongst the local Teochew population. He was actually one of the founding fathers of the Nian uh, Girls School. At that time, it was called the Nian Girls School. Uh, later, the name changed to Nian Primary School. Uh, at that time, uh, he, was, uh, he was helping the colonial government look after the interests of, of women as well as children. Uh, and one of the uh, tenets of the Nian Kongsi was to actually help in terms of education. Among numerous accomplishments, Lim Kin Seng is perhaps best remembered for his contribution to education. But grandson James Yip holds other impressions of the man. He spent a lot of his time actually uh, visiting uh, the homes of underprivileged Chinese uh, Teochew populations in Singapore. Uh, he visited the prisons uh, in Singapore as well to make sure that Chinese inmates were uh, Take, well taken care of and, and, and that they were not abused. Uh, he was also uh, appointed as a justice of a peace uh, and that also allowed him to actually uh, you know, sign people's marriages and at the same time keep track of the local populace. Lim Kim Seng's dedication to education and social courses caught the attention of the British authorities. In 1954, he was one of the few locals to be conferred the member of the most excellent order of the British Empire. Member of the most excellent order of the British Empire is a highly desirable award that entitles its members to the usage of Sir or Dame before their names. Over at another hill lies another pioneer who was similarly conferred the Order of the British Empire and known for his fiery temper. The majority of Chinese tombs in these parts are built in the traditional Omega layout. However, there are those that detract from the norm, such as the tomb of Li Kim Su, the maker of LKS matchsticks, also known as the Matchstick King one of few adventurously built in Art Deco splendor. When the British returned to power after the war, Singapore was besieged by a period of social unrest. Peter Park tells us about one pioneer who faced up to rioters. So in the 50s, um, it was very turbulent years for Singapore. So there were labor union riots, there were also uh, communist unrest in Singapore. So some of these com uh, communists, what they did was they burned buses tra or transportations in Singapore to, 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 to create an atmosphere of, of fear, I, I suppose. So one of the main targets of buses being burned was Te Koyat's buses. Te Koyat came to Singapore, a poor migrant from Kingman, at the age of 22. 
He was best known for being a pioneer in public transport. He set up the Tekoyat Bus Company in 1938. He noticed that the transportation system in Singapore was very poor, and he decided to do something, something about it to help improve the transportation system in Singapore. So in 1921, with only two buses, he ended up being one of the largest bus companies in Singapore. The bus riots of 1955 arose from industrial disputes and social strife. Although most of the buses targeted were those from the Hock Lee Bus Company, Teiko Yat's buses were not spared. In the papers, an account of Mr. Teiko Yat with his driver tailing one of his buses, witnessing four arsonists trying to burn his bus. In the 50s, Mr. Teiko Yat himself was in his 70s already. Just imagine a 70-year-old man coming out from his car and saying, Tank up! Tank up! Which means uh, in Malay, catch, catch this arsonist. And, uh, and that helped prevent it, I, I suppose, the bus from being burned. Even though unrest was rife at that time, life went on, and people made time for entertainment. In that sense, you have a very cosmopolitan culture, popular culture evolving in the 1950s with at its roots going back to the 1930s with the introduction of the radio and the gramophone newspapers. So you already have the basis pre-World War II of this diversity of uh, popular cultures from China, from the US increasingly, from Europe. And this is now then played out in the 1950s. Amusement parks such as Great World, New World and Beauty World rose in popularity and offered venues for various types of performers. Performances were a very important part of the entertainments at the Worlds. You had uh, Chinese song and dance troops, the Ge Tuan. You had Bangsa Wan troops from Indonesia. You had um, bands, dance hall bands from the Philippines. And you can see all these troops travelled around the region performing at different venues. Um, so performing troops, travelling performing troops was a very important part of the regional entertainment scene. And outside the Worlds, these included the circuses as well. One such popular circus troupe was the Tai Tian Q Circus. In the mid-1950s, the death-defying acts and exotic animals captured the imagination of the young and old. Lisa Leong is a descendant of Sun Si Ting, the founder of Tai Tian Q Circus. At Bukit Brown, she pays her respects to her great-grandfather. My grandfather was actually one of Sun's son-in-law. His name is Si Bing Sen. His name is also engraved on the tomb. I was actually quite intrigued because uh, I don't know of anybody who tells me that his or her grandfather is, uh, let's say, a circus proprietor or someone involved in any circus business. The Tai Tian Q Circus disbanded at the outbreak of World War II, but reunited after normalcy returned. Actually, Sun Siting died before uh, the Japanese surrender. His two sons and two son-in-law uh, took over the reins of the circus. But after the, the Japanese surrender, the, the circus was physically no longer existing. Uh, I mean, the facilities were gone, the animals were dead. So they actually had to rebuild from the start. Um, so what they did was, um, they actually have to uh, buy those uh, army tents uh, from Sungai Road and uh, sew them up again. That was how they made their first tent. The Sun family turned adversity into opportunity. And at its peak, the Tai Tian Q Circus toured Malaya and the region even as far as the Philippines. On a recent visit to a flea market, Lisa chanced upon an unexpected find. Rare photos capturing unforgettable moments of the Tai Tian Q Circus. They held precious memories of various acts and more importantly, those of her aunt, a performer in the troupe. Uh, I didn't expect to find anything of that sort. And uh, of course, uh, as anyone would expect, I bought them all. <laughs> Whilst Lisa is momentarily reunited with her family's past glory, Anne Lim, a cousin to James Yip reconciles with memories of her grandfather, Lim Kim Seng. 
He died in, on the 20th of August 1967. I was doing my O-levels that, at that time. I have very fond memories of him. I think he loved me a lot because I'm one of the grandkids that stayed with him all, all these years. I think he was a very kind-hearted man because I remembered at one incident there was a, a, a lady from, from Suatau, China, who came out to Singapore and he was with the Ngiang Kong Si. And he, he recommended this lady to the Ngiang Primary School to sell sweets and chocolates. And, uh, you know, he, he, he always cares about, about those not so fortunate people. Lim King Sen passed away in 1967 and his funeral stood as a testament of the high regard people held for him. When he died, we had a very big thing regarding his funeral. There are lots of people from the Teochew clan, you know, and uh, quite a lot of people came, all relatives and friends and business associates. While Anne holds precious her first-hand recollection of her grandfather, James Yip, who was only two months old when Lim Kim Singh died, can only content with accounts he gathered from his mother. I've always known uh, from my mum that he was an early Teochew leader, uh, a great man in his time. Uh, but it's only in the last few years, uh, with a bit of soul searching, and also with the pending demise of uh, part of Bukit Brown Cemetery, that you know, I, I began to search my roots and begin to wonder who my grandparents uh, actually were. Uh, and I, I think this in part is, is every Singaporean's hope to, to want to know, you know what happened in, in those days. And I think Bukit Brown is an important and integral part of uh, our, our nation's history. Because uh, without Bukit Brown and we, without looking at all the individual people who have played a role in Bukit Brown, uh, we would not really be the Singapore that we are today. The foundation of Singapore rests firmly on the tombs of our forefathers. From the humble working classes to the wealthy Taukes who answered the needs of the community. All are honoured here for the part they played in our history.